If you have a Bible, I'd like to invite you to turn with me to the book of 1 Kings chapter 3. If you're new to the Foundry, we're in a series called The Throne. We're looking at the ancient kingdom of Israel and the people that sat on that throne. This morning, we're going to look at a king named Solomon. And as I was reading some of the text, some of the stories about Solomon, God kept putting a question on my heart. Over and over again, the same question came up. And this was the simple question, whom do you seek? Whom do you seek? Over and over again. Some of you are like, well, what do you mean, whom do you seek? That's a weird statement. Well, it's proper English. That's why it sounds weird. Whom do you seek? There, let me tell you a story, and, and, and this will make sense. A few years ago, a friend of mine uh, knocked on my door. I hadn't seen him in a long time. It was 8 o'clock at night. I was like, hello, friend. I haven't seen in two years. What's up? He said, let's go for a ride. I said, all right. So I get in his car, and we're driving around, and it was really awkward. It was strange. So I finally just, uh, all these thoughts, like, what is going on? What are we doing? So I, I started getting nervous. It's like, what are you, you going to do, murder me in here? Is this an episode of The Sopranos? Like, wh what is, what, what's up? And my friend began to tell me all of his struggles, and specifically some of the problems in his marriage, and how it, it just had completely derailed. Like, it had been going on for a long time. And I said to him something to the extent of like, oh, why did you wait so long? And why are you talking to me? I haven't seen you forever. And he said, because I have nowhere else to go. Who do you seek in the struggle when something is difficult and you don't know what to do? When there's a problem and you don't have the answer, who is it that you seek out? When you're not sure what the next step is, who is it? That you seek is it is it a friend is it a family member a, a teacher maybe it's a pastor or a counselor or a therapist maybe it's not a person at all maybe it's this it's google because there's an answer for everything on google at least so i found out so maybe you you do you turn to something online for an answer or a podcast or <clears throat> a book that you read who is it that you're seeking in the difficult times and then the more I started thinking about it, who you seek isn't just a question that we ask in difficult times. It's a question that you ask when things are going well, in normal everyday life. Who you seek is a powerful question because it's a question about how you orient your life. What do you work towards? What do you try to succeed? What do you try to get in your life? Maybe the thing you seek, again, isn't a person, but it's a thing. Like maybe you seek comfort so in your life the thing that gives you comfort and security is money and so your life is about money making sure that you make enough money and you have enough money and that you save enough money and so everything that you're trying to attain and seek in your life is about money maybe the thing you seek is popularity and for some reason friends and having enough friends gives you some sort of value and worth so you're chasing that in your life you're focused on making sure you have enough relationships and even online that you have enough followers and enough loves or likes and you you spend a lot of your life even on your phone at the expense of real relationships or maybe the thing that you seek is just like pleasure and as long as your life is having a good time then you're fine or maybe it's status and power and so the thing that you're seeking you find that in a job as you climb the ladder, people look up to you, and the higher you climb, the more people look up to you, and the more that gives you some sort of purpose. And so your life, the thing you're seeking, is your work, and you'll work at the expense of everything else, including your family. Who you seek is a powerful question because it reveals what you put your hope and your trust in. What do you trust in when you struggle? Who is it that you seek? That person would be your savior, who would help you? Who do you seek in the everyday life reveals what you would put your hope in? What you hope is, if I attain this, it'll give me some sort of purpose, some sort of value, some sort of meaning. It's a powerful question. This is why scripture over and over again calls us as followers of Christ to seek God. It's mentioned something like 400 times in the Old Testament alone to seek God. And I will hope when I said, who do you seek? You'd think, I seek God. 
When I struggle, I'm on my knees. I'm in prayer. When, when everyday life, I wake up in the morning, I desire God's presence, I'm reading, I'm spending time in silence. I, I would hope you would say, you know what, I do. I seek God. But if I'm honest, I don't always seek God. I mean, once as a pastor of a small church, we had a verbal lease agreement. And the things I've learned is never have a verbal lease agreement. It just does not end well. So one day we were informed we can no longer meet at this place we met to worship and you sort of need a place to meet, to worship, to be a church. So I am freaking out. I'm calling, I'm stressed out, I'm calling friends. friends. I'm calling real estate agents trying to find a place. My friend walks in the office. I told him my problems. He looked at me and said, well, did you pray about it? I said, yeah. I mean, pastors pray a lot, right? No, I didn't. And he looks at me and said, well, don't you think maybe you should pray first before you, you know, you go through all this work? Ugh. The guy was always right. See, sometimes I knew I should have seek God, but it, I just tried to handle it myself. Sometimes we know, oh, we should be seeking God in this situation. We do the same, or we turn to other things, or we turn to other people, or maybe we don't even know what it looks like. Okay, what does this look like for me to seek God right here and now? And what I want to do today is just simply look at that. Who do you seek? What does it mean to seek God? And I want to look at a life of a man named Solomon, a king. Because in Solomon's life, there are two stories we're going to look at. He goes through a difficult time, and he goes through a good time, but in both times you see a king seeking God. I just want to look at these stories and make some simple observations about what it means then for us to be people who could answer that question, who do you seek, confidently and say, I seek God, in both a good time and a bad. And the first story is found in 1 Kings chapter 3. And this is when Solomon is first becoming king. And it said, The king went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices, for that was the most important high place. And Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. And at Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream and said, Ask for whatever you want me to give you. There's a genie in a bottle, right? Solomon answered, You've shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You've continued this great kindness to him, have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. Now, Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, but I am only a little child, and I don't know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number, so give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between what's right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? And the Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. There are famous section of verses where Solomon asked for wisdom. We'll talk about that more next week, but I want to focus on just the first line of this verse. It says that Solomon went to Gibeon to offer a thousand burnt offerings at a high place. It's easy to skip over that, but there's a lot there. Now, this is the ancient city of Gibeon on a map. It is about five miles northwest of Jerusalem. You have to travel through quite a bit of mountains to go from Jerusalem to Gibeon where he goes so it's not an easy journey and it said he went to this place and we have another picture of it where you can see sort of what it would have looked like or what it looks like today he went to a high place and you're on okay what's a high place well a high place is literally a place that is high you're welcome you have to understand the mindset is completely different it's pre-modern it's not like we think for them, the way they thought about gods and how the world worked was different. Um, besides the Israelites, every other culture had multiple gods. And the gods were considered to be way up here in the sky somewhere, often distant, often far away. And so say you were a farmer and you needed it to rain, you would then offer a sacrifice to this god of agriculture or rain so that it would rain, you could grow crops, and you could survive. But how did you know that the god would... Uh, hear, see your sacrifice, be pleased with you. Well, you would travel closer to that God, to the tops of these high places to offer it so that God would recognize your sacrifices. So all throughout the ancient land, you see high places. We have a picture of one in Petra, a really famous high place. So there are all sorts of sacrifices and altars made on tops of these mountains and on tops of these hills. And the Israelites were instructed 
you know what, you're not really supposed to go there. Because there's so much pagan worship, so many things that are not moralistically good. Like the Canaanites even offered sacrifices of children to a god named Molech on these high places. Even Moses said this in Deuteronomy. He said, destroy completely all the high places on the high mountains, on the hills. And you can read the rest of it. This isn't the only verse where you see this. Destroy high places, get rid of it. You see it all in the Old Testament. And yet Solomon travels across the mountain to go to a place he's not really supposed to be at. It says he offered a thousand burnt offerings. Now there's several types of offerings the Israelites offered, but a burnt offering was an animal, usually a lamb or a cow. A lamb was three days wage, a cow was almost a year, which means he offered at minimum, if it's a thousand, three years worth of wages. At max, it's a thousand years of wage. This is a significant offering, and it said it's a burnt offering. A burnt offering is unique in that it's involuntary. Don't have to make it. Don't have to do it. And it's given for a specific purpose. And this is the easiest way to simplify it. It's given for a purpose to show that you are lowly. You are broken. You are in need of God. God, here is an animal. Recognize that I am not you. I need your help here and now. All of these details point us to a very simple truth. That seeking God begins in the heart. Solomon travels across mountains to get to a place he's not supposed to go, offers a ton of money and sacrifices in a sacrifice he doesn't have to make. Why? Because he desperately needed God in his life at this point. No other reason a king would do this, a man would travel that far, unless he had a deep desire in his heart for God to be here and present with him. Seeking God begins first and foremost deep in here with the desire for God to be present with you. Which led me to a really simple question that I had to ask myself. And this is a question. Do I have a deep desire for God's presence in my life? Is that what my heart desires? If I'm going through a struggle... Are my prayers, Lord, I need you here with me to journey through this thing with you? Are my prayers more like this, like, Lord, help, get rid of this, solve this, take care of this? Is my desire just for the problem to be gone, or is my desire in the midst of a struggle for God to be with me in the midst of it? Or maybe it's not that. Maybe things are going well. Is the desire in my heart, in my life, for God's presence when I wake up in the morning to spend time with him to say, Lord, I need you here and now with me this very day. Or is there something else in my heart that's taken over that? I don't know what it would be. Maybe it's money or comfort or wealth, whatever it may be where you used to love going to church. You used to love waking up. It used to be so important to you and now it's just sort of something you do. Solomon shows us, first and foremost, that to seek God, it begins here. That's why seeking God is the Hebrew word darash. It literally means to chase or to yearn after. So maybe the first thing we need to do is just examine our hearts. To say, are you first? Is this what I desire more than anything? It's you. And some of you may say, well, why was Solomon's heart so bent on seeking God. And I think it's simple because he's going through something really difficult here and now. He's just a new king. He has to live up to his father David's shoes. Those are not small shoes to fill. There's some problems. His other brothers wanted to be king. Some dysfunction in that family he's got to overcome. But then he says this. This is the real issue. He says, I'm only a little child. I don't know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you've chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. He said, look, I'm a kid. And I don't know what I'm doing. This is too big. There's too many people. I don't know how to handle this. This points out a simple truth about seeking God. It requires humility. Think about this. Solomon is potentially probably the wealthiest person on earth at this point. Also probably the most powerful man on earth. He has 
uh, generals and armies and chariots and uh, palaces and counselors and sages. He's got everything he, he wants at his fingertips. And yet here is a man who falls before God and says, I can't do that. Think about the amount of humility it would take for a man with that many resources to simply say, this is too big for me. When you have an entire kingdom at your fingertips that could handle everything. For us to seek God, it requires humility to say to God, I need you here and now. This is too big. To ask for help is hard because we have to swallow pride. Sometimes it's hard to do that. I once took on a housing project in my own house. Like, it was a small one. I thought, I could do this. I'll handle this. I was telling my friend about it. My friend can do anything with his hands. He's like, I'll come over. I can help you as a plumber. He's like, no, I don't need your help, which I did. Um, I got it. So then I was telling another friend I had a question. He was a builder. It's like, and he's like, well, why don't I just come over and help you? I was like, no, I'm good. And then I had another friend who was a builder and a contractor who built hundreds of houses a year. He said, you know what? Why don't I come over? I could send some guys. We could get this done. I was like, no, I'm, I'm good. And I remember the project taking way too long. It was a nightmare. And I'm complaining to Lindsay, my wife. And I was tired and sore when it was done. And she said, well, why didn't you, why didn't you ask your friend? He's a builder. And I said, because I'm a man. <sighs> men don't ask for help and all the ladies said amen we're never lost we don't need direction sometimes it's hard especially for guys to ask for help because asking for help for some of us means that we're weak we can't handle it and we live in a culture especially in the united states that kind of takes pride on to be having to care for yourself take care of it. we pulled ourselves up by our own bootstraps this is sort of the way this uh, uh, culture thinks about life and, and that can seep into faith I've even heard people say well, God only helps those who help themselves like you're supposed to do it and that's, that's not in the Bible it's not so sometimes asking for help is difficult it's difficult because we have to swallow pride I thought about why didn't I ask my friend it's because I was too proud but to seek God requires us to swallow the pride humble ourselves and say, God, I need you here and now. It requires a humble heart. And this is what Solomon does. And then the story goes on that God was pleased. And we'll read more about the story next week. And he gives and makes Solomon the wisest man in all of Scripture. And then he said, I'm not only going to give you wisdom, I'm going to give you everything else you ever dreamed of. Money, status, power, it's all yours. And you see at this point forward, this is really the high point of the Israel kingdom. And the things that happen in Solomon's life after this story, it goes really well for him. In fact, he starts beginning expanding this kingdom and building thing after thing after thing. And he's so wise, so rich, so powerful, people would visit him and just be amazed by it. And so he starts building cities and he builds palaces and then he builds this, the temple. And this is where we pick up the second story. And this is just artist representations of the temple. You can find it in Kings, a bunch of verses about what the temple looked like. I don't have time to go into all the details, but this was a magnificent structure. Uh, if you read in the Old Testament, it said it took 150,000 people seven years to build it. It said another thing you can read throughout, they collected like money for the temple. They collected 108 thousand talents of gold one million talents of silver one talent is 75 pounds which means that the temple cost 216 billion dollars just a nice fixer-upper this was such a magnificent building that the historian josephus wrote about it and he said that the exterior of the building wanted nothing that could astound either mind or eye for being covered on all sides with massive plates of gold. The sun was no sooner up that it radiated so fiery a flash that persons straining to look at it were compelled to avert their eyes as from the solar rays. You couldn't stare at this building in the sun. How good is life when you can build something worth $216 billion? It's going well. 
And at this point, Solomon, after it's completed, calls all the Israelites together. They throw this huge party, and they're going to dedicate this temple to God. And in chapter 8, you see a big prayer of dedication. I just want to point out just one small part of that prayer. I don't have time to look at it all. But Solomon said this in his prayer before the people. He said, will God really dwell on earth? The heavens, even the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this temple I have built. Yet give attention to your servant's prayer and his pleas for mercy. Lord my God, hear the cry and prayer that your servant is praying in your presence this day. May your eyes be open towards this temple day and night. The place which you have said, my name shall be here so that you will hear the prayers your servant prays towards this place. Hear the supplication of your servant of your people Israel when they pray towards this place. Hear from heaven your dwelling place and when you hear forgive and so his prayer is lord don't be distant don't be far away come here in this place be with us in the midst of this place and listen to us and answer prayers you see in the midst of something really good here's a man still seeking god even in his prayers be with us and after the prayer they begin to offer sacrifices to god and in 1 Kings chapter 9, it says, The king and all Israel with him offered sacrifices before the Lord, and Solomon offered a sacrifice, a fellowship offering to the Lord of 22,000 cattle, one year's wage for one cow. Jeez. And 20,000 sheep and goats. Sorry, 120,000 sheep and goats. So the king and all Israelites dedicated the temple of the Lord. A scholar I was reading said that it would have taken over a week straight, 24 hours, just to make all the sacrifices by all the priests. And I want to stop here just for a second and point out another truth about seeking God. Seeking God requires a sacrifice. When you seek God, you're chasing after him. It means you're putting him first, which means everything else comes second. And you see this with Solomon's life. He, he wants God to be present with his people, so he's willing to sacrifice his time, his talents, his manpower, his gold, his money, even to make the sacrifices themselves. For us, if we're going to have a heart that seeks after God, it means we have to be willing to sacrifice. We have to be willing to say, okay, God, I want you first and everything else is second. And sometimes that's hard because the sacrifice we have to make is a sacrifice of the self. It's a sacrifice of your time to get up in the morning, to read, to pray, to be still. Sacrifice of your Sunday to go to church, to worship. It's a sacrifice to serve others, to care for your neighbors, to serve at your church. It's a sacrifice of your resources to give to help churches, to help organizations, to help people. It's a sacrifice sometimes of your comfort to go where God may be calling you to go. And I think that's why sometimes when things are going really well, it's difficult to have a heart that seeks God. Because if I got stuff figured out, if it's going well, if I'm comfortable, why would would I put that second when, when, when everything's so great? Why would I want to put God first when I got it all figured out? That's a good question. And I want to answer that question by just reading the rest of the story and making a point to say, why would I be willing to have a heart that's going to sacrifice? Put God first and everything else second. See, the story ends like this. It said the Lord appeared to Solomon. So God's presence filled the temple. He appears to Solomon a second time. As he had appeared to him at Gibeon, and the Lord said, I've heard the prayer and plea you've made before me. I've consecrated this temple which you have built and putting my name there forever. My eyes and heart will always be there. As for you, if you walk before me faithfully, with integrity, heart, and uprightness, as David your father did, and do all I command and observe my decrees and laws, I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever. As I had promised David your father when I said, you shall never fail to have a successor on the throne. But if you or your descendants turn away from me and do not observe the commands and decrees I have given you and go off and reject this and serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel from the land I have given them and I will reject this temple I have consecrated for my name. Israel will become a byword and an object of ridicule among the people and this temple will become a heap of rubble. The story ends. And these two stories are very similar. 
Solomon travels to a sacred high place. He offers sacrifices and God shows up. Solomon goes to what I would call a sacred place, a temple. He offers sacrifices and God shows up and answers prayer. The main difference is the type of offering made. The first offering was a burnt offering which says, I'm lowly, I'm not worthy, I need your help. The, the second one is called a fellowship offering. And a fellowship offering was different. It was given, as some scholars say, the fellowship offering is also called a peace offering. It was given as a sign of peace. The, the offering was made as an invitation by Solomon. And he invites God to be at one and at peace with his people from now and for eternity. And this is why he makes this as a peace offering to say, God, I want you here to be one with us. All of these little things point us to a very simple truth. And the last point, seeking God is an invitation. It is. Solomon begins with a prayer. A prayer that invites God to say, be here with us, be present with us. Then he makes a sacrifice. And he says, God, this sacrifice is an invitation for you to be here present. And then God shows up and answers his prayer and speaks and said, I will be with you. I'll be with you forever if you keep seeking me. It's an invitation to me. But if you turn and you don't want me here, I'm going to leave. And your people, you're on your own. And this temple is just going to become rubble. Seeking God is an invitation, not because like, we're looking for God because he's lost. Seeking God is an invitation for the creator of the world to show up in your life and to journey with you. And when you do that, it changes everything. You ask, well, like, why would I have a heart that seeks God and make those sacrifices? Because you're inviting the Prince of Peace, the author of life, to be here with you in your midst, to journey with you. And when that happens, God says, I'll be with you. It can change everything around. I had a friend named Ralph who this happened to. Ralph is like this big teddy bear of a guy. You just want to hug him when you see him. He exemplifies what I think it means to like love people like Christ did. And I met him sort of in a band. He has a goatee. He's a, he's a, little, he's a lot older than me. And he was a drummer. We used to make fun of him. We'd tell the joke like, Ralph, what do you call the guy who hangs out with all the musicians? He's like, what, the drummer? <laughs> uh, it was such a good sport. And I got to hear some of Ralph's story. And he said, you know, I went to church, whatever, went through it. But in his mid-20s, late 20s, he came to head with his struggle with alcoholism. And his wife was going to leave him with the kids. And he said, I woke up one morning on a lawn. And I didn't know where I was. And I didn't know how I got there. And he said, it was then and there I realized this was too big for me and I'm chasing the wrong things and he said it was then and there I really began to seek God now I want you to fast forward Ralph is now 60 and he's a grandpa and he's standing next to me in a church and we're walking down this aisle because we're going to graduate seminary together God has taken him through this struggle he's been sober for decades and now is using his life to touch the lives of thousands of people and change the lives of thousands of people with the message of Christ. See, this is the power of seeking God when you invite the creator of the universe into your life. He can take whatever is going on, good or bad, and use it for something great. Greater than you could ever imagine. See, perhaps this morning you're struggling. Maybe the problem's too big. You don't know what to do. There's no light at the end of the tunnel, as they say. Seeking God is an invitation. If you humble yourself, examine your heart, make the sacrifice, seek him. It's an invitation for the Prince of Peace, the great counselor, the author of life to intervene. It may not solve your problem right away. You may have to journey through it. It may be a struggle, but you don't have to do it alone. 
God's waiting for you to humble yourself and invite him to journey with you. And maybe for some of you, it's going well. You got it figured out. I'm glad. I really am. But maybe there's something greater. Maybe even you recognize it, like this is good. Maybe there's more. Maybe God looks at your life and says, that's, that's great, but man, there's something even more I, I have. I want to use you to do something even greater than you can imagine if you're just willing to turn to me, to seek me. See, this morning we started with this question, whom do you seek? And it's the same one we end with. Whom do you seek? Solomon shows us if we're willing to change our hearts. We're willing to humble ourselves and sacrifice. It's an invitation for God to show up and not just change your life and bless you, but to bless the entire world around you. So I ask you one more time, whom do you seek? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the life of Solomon, the things we can learn from him this morning, the way that your voice always is speaking and teaching us. Lord, I pray that we can become people that chase after you, people willing to humble, people willing to sacrifice, people willing to invite you. I pray that you use us in this church to bless the world around us with the message of your goodness, of your love. If there are things that we need to change this morning in our hearts so that you are first, give us the strength, give us the power to make that step this morning. Lord, help us be people who can answer that question, whom do you seek, by saying, it's you, with all my heart. We pray this in your name. Amen.